Okay, so maybe we'll start, you know, I know people will probably filter in a little bit late, but um, um, yeah, welcome to the second day, and uh, thanks for coming out. And uh, our first speaker of, of today is uh, Sasha Gregorian, um, who will talk about heat curls in ultraventric spaces. So. All right, thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, for the first time, I learned about Dojuk in 1980s when I was a PhD student, um, and I read his paper about construction of heat kernel on arbitrary Riemannian manifold. Do you remember still what that was? Right? <laughs> yes. That was my first reading about this subject, and this shaped my interest in this area for many years ahead. And then, in about 10 years, I met Jozik personally when I visited CUNY uh, and we became friends here. So I enjoyed his uh, personality, in mm -hmm. fact, right? Um, especially as we were able to speak not only in English but also in Russian. <laughs> that also uh, quite makes difference, right? Uh, perhaps not everybody uh, here knows that he solves not only mathematical problems, right? He's capable of solving problems of different types, <laughs> um, practical problems. In one of my uh, visits uh, to New York, um, taxi driver drove away with my suitcase in the car, <laughs> leaving me alone on the street without anything. <laughs> so I was desperate, I called to Dodjuk, and he came immediately to rescue me. <laughs> and we started um, this Mission Impossible, and I find this suitcase in New York City, right? Can you imagine? <laughs> but surprisingly enough, uh, we did it, thanks to Jozik. <laughs> uh, I don't tell you how, but <laughs> in the end it was happy end. <laughs> so, um, so now I'm really pleased, very pleased to congratulate uh, Jozik with this birthday and wish him all the best mm. and continue his problem-solving uh, <laughs> exercises right, in mathematics and also in other uh, areas. So this um, talk is about heat kernels, uh, as it says, on ultrametric spaces, but I will start with more traditional heat kernels on Riemannian manifold, this subject that many people know. Um, but quite a short um, overview, uh, just as motivation for the question that will follow. So, um, M will denote an arbitrary Riemannian manifold, and delta is Laplace Beltrami operator there. And the main object here is the heat equation, du, uh, dTU equals to delta U. Uh, which uh, has always the minimal positive fundamental solution that is called the heat kernel, and well denoted by PTXY. So the heat kernel is a function as of T and X, as it's written here, uh, satisfying the heat equation, and um, it converges to delta function at Y when T goes to zero. So as I already mentioned, um, one of the first construction of the heat kernel was done by Josip Dodzik uh, in 1983 by looking at first heat kernel in precompact domain and then by exhausting the whole manifold by sequence of such domains. And there is alternative construction of this uh, notion of heat kernel, in particular by Bob Schrichartz, who uh, divide, defined heat kernel as the integral kernel of the heat semigroup e to the t delta, where delta has to be first extended to a self-adjoint operator in L2, which is always can be done. Um, another alternative description of the heat kernel, more probabilistic one, is that it is actually um, the same as the transition density for Brownian motion on Riemannian manifold which means that if you start, uh, denote by xt this random trajectory, then probability that this trajectory hits a set A, Borel set A, if started at point x, is given just by integral of the heat kernel over the set A. So it's the density of, this is transition probability, and this is density of this. It's very uh, useful sometimes uh, also for intuition to understand 
relation between heat kernel and geometry of the manifold. So the classical heat kernel in Euclidean space uh, is a gauss weierstrass function, which is known, which is taught in all elementary PDE courses. Um, but the question that uh, was extensively discussed in mathematical literature is obtaining estimates of heat kernel, assuming that manifold M is geodesically complete and non-compact. There is explicit formula also for hyperbolic spaces, but generally um, there is no way to get explicit formula. One can hope to get some estimates. So I'll state only one result here. There are plenty of different results also by people who sit in this uh, room today. But um, uh, for the sake of this talk, I need only one uh, result to cite. So I always denote by mu Riemannian measure d geodesic distance, b geodesic goal. Right? So this is a um, celebrated uh, theorem of Li and Yao, which influenced a lot of this subject, that if manifold has no negative Ricci curvature everywhere, then the heat kernel is comparable to this function, which has similar shape to this gauss weierstrass function, um, Gaussian exponential function with distance squared over some constant, positive constant c times t. And instead of term t to the power n over 2 here, it's a measure of Riemannian volume of ball of radius square root of t of radius x, also with some constant. And this symbol means comparable, that is, there is also, uh, there is upper and lower bound uh, with this uh, right-hand side, but constant C small and C capital may be different for upper and lower bound. Um, so, then uh, it was established that, in fact, this estimate holds not only on manifolds of non-negative Ricci curvature, on a more general class of manifold that I'm about to describe it, um, so, to state the result, um, which is also needed as motivation here, uh, I need two conditions. So one is so-called volume doubling condition, which frequently occurs in many questions, uh, which is written here. Volume of ball of radius 2R is bounded by some constant times volume of ball of radius R with the same center. Constant is the same for all uh, X and R. And second is Poincaré inequality, which has the same shape as in Euclidean space. Um, um, but, okay, uh, it's holds in Euclidean space, but also can hold on other manifolds, also in particular manifolds of non-negative Ricci curvature. Um, here is just to uh, get some flavor of that example of manifold where this uh, Poincaré inequality is not satisfied. This is two copies of RN glued together through a compact tube. Uh, this manifold does satisfy volume doubling, but doesn't satisfy Poincaré because of presence of this bottleneck, right? Poincaré inequality somehow prohibits bottlenecks. So um, then uh, Li Yao turns out that Li Yao estimate is actually equivalent. It holds if and only if this volume doubling condition and Poincaré inequality hold um, on given manifold. Um, so this uh, can be regarded as motivation for what follows. So the main uh, subject of this talk is actually, um, uh, yeah, maybe from probabilistic point of view, all this about diffusion on Riemannian manifold because heat kernel, as I said, is transition density of uh, Brownian motion, which is a diffusion process. That is Markov process with continuous trajectories. But this talk, in fact, will be about jump processes. These are Markov processes with discontinuous trajectories, and uh, like random walks, it's random point just jumps over the space in question. Right, this is similar to random walk on graph that Matthias Keller was explaining yesterday. But uh, on other uh, spaces. But to start with, uh, let me just recall a few facts about jump pro some examples of jump processes in RA. So Laplace Beltrami operator, as I already mentioned, generates diffusion process on manifold M. Uh, but 
if one considers this power of this operator, I have to take minus because delta is negative definite here in this talk. So um, if we take Laplace operator to power beta over 2, where beta is between 0 and 2, that is, this power is between 0 and 1. And this operator generates a so-called symmetric stable Levy process of index beta, um, which is a Markov process with jumps. Right? This is well known in probability theory. Uh, and also, it's known that one can actually, uh, um, it's, this process has also a heat kernel, that is density of uh, transition probability. In particular, there is one formula in the case when beta is 1, that is square root of Laplace operator, generates a Levy process of index 1 whose heat kernel has exact formula. Uh, it's uh, this formula, it's uh, different, of course, from... Is this on Rn? In Rn, yes, only in Rn. Yeah, I didn't, uh, ah, I didn't say, okay. right. Uh, it's in Rn only, yeah, thank you for this uh, <laughs> remark. Um, uh, of course, it's different from uh, transition density of diffusion process, um, which one can even better see if this index uh, is arbitrary, then the heat kernel, although without explicit exact formula, it has similar estimate of this shape, um, which looks like uh, this exact formula, but I will rewrite this in equivalent form as here on the right-hand side, uh, where we could see a certain relation to, compare at least to gauss weierstrass function. Mm -hmm. Its own diagonal behavior is given by this t to the power n divided by beta. Um, and tail of this, when x and y are far away, is not exponential like in Gaussian case, but this power function, this power function. And scaling between space, that is mod x minus y, and time is given through this power 1 over beta. Mm -hmm. right? There are a uh, few uh, components in this type of estimate. It's on diagonal behavior, which tells you how quickly it goes to zero when t goes to infinity. Uh, then scaling between distance and time, which is given by this power, and then the shape of this tail function. Right? These are all, one can trace similar thing in um, uh, diffusion case and in this case, but um, sh main difference is that tail function is here power function, whereas in diffusion k that was exponential function. Right. Um, so this uh, estimate uh, actually follows from, uh, more or less directly from the explicit formula for uh, uh, heat kernel of diffusion by so-called subordination technique. I don't go into details, just uh, to emphasize that it's just consequence of the other one. Right. Now, um, but we are going to consider jump processes not in Rn, but on more general underlying space. And there is well-known technology how one can construct Markov processes on general metric measure spaces. Um, uh, so we start with um, fixing some locally compact metric space Md and uh, choose some reference measure mu as Radon measure with full support. Right? And then uh, further we fix a function j x y which will determine jumps, that's why it's denoted by j, uh, on this space non-negative symmetric function on m times m, and consider quadratic form which is determined by this function and by reference measure uh, in L2. Right. So this quadratic form may take infinite values, but then one should restrict it to domain when it's, it's finite, and then, under certain situations, it can happen, it's quite frequently the case, that it extends to so-called regular Dirichlet form. Well, this uh, audience probably is not quite uh, right for this subject, but uh, this uh, basically this means that domain of this where it's finite must be dense in L2, and also some other condition must be satisfied, right? Um, it's why it's so because it's well known that any regular Dirichlet form determines a Markov process, and in particular, if it's of this form, then it determines a jump process. Right? 
Um, it's all um, written in the book of Fukushima theory of Dirichlet form, um, which makes quite a direct relation between quadratic forms of this type, of more general type, with construction of Markov processes. So uh, anyway, um, if it's the case, then generator of this form is this operator, which we can regard as extension, uh, kind of analogous of Laplace Beltrami operator, but this time is difference operator with this uh, uh, density j x y here, which in fact uh, can be also seen as extension of weighted Laplace operator on the graph that Matthias was um, explaining um, in his talk yesterday, right? In fact, this J can be seen as weight on the graph, right? Adjusted to a measure. Right? Um, and then uh, the heat kernel uh, of this Dirichlet form with the domain F is uh, the integral density of the heat semigroup. This operator happens to be self adjoint <coughs> non-positive definite, so one has this um, heat semigroup as family of operators in L2, and um, if it has integral kernel, then it's uh, called the heat kernel, right? This is analogous to Srihar's definition of uh, heat kernel in, on Riemannian manifold, but this can be done in abstract situation, right? So, again, uh, this heat kernel is the same as transition density of the associated jump process, and the jump process is determined by this jump kernel, which de uh, actually describes intensity of jumps from x to y. It's not ki kind of pr probability, but uh, it's, um, um, <coughs> it can be used for probabilistic description. Right. So this is cons uh, standard construction of abstract spaces. Uh, <coughs> Um, in particular, if we return back to Euclidean space, um, the, to uh, Levy process, the symmetric stable process of index beta with this generator, then turns out that uh, the corresponding jump kernel is very simple. It's just mod x minus y to power minus n plus beta, where beta is the same index. Uh, so uh, this would be can be considered as alternative construction of this process. One can start either with generator or one can start with um, uh, oops. with the Dirichlet form with this jump kernel, and then turns out that in this case it's very simple. So, and again, uh, this all works if beta is between 0 and 2, but if beta, if we take here, in, of course, jump kernel can be defined also when beta is arbitrary, in particular beta is at least 2, but then the quadratic form doesn't extend to a proper Dirichlet form, so there is no process in this case. If, if beta is 2 or bigger, is it even a jump process? Or, I mean... Sorry. Is, it, is it just that the Dirichlet form fails? Yeah, Dirichlet yeah. form fails and no, no jump process. No, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. this yeah. is exactly the same. Right? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the reason for that is for beta equals to two corresponds to diffusion process, and the Dirichlet form should be constructed in different ways. Right. In okay. fact, Dirichlet form in this case is classical Dirichlet integral, right? Mm -hmm. It's given by the derivative, not by um, non local operator. Mm -hmm. um, right. So the, one of the questions that uh, came um, up from this consideration is uh, under what conditions of the metric measure space in abstract situation uh, the heat kernel of the associated Dirichlet form exists and satisfies the following estimate that I will call stable-like estimate. This estimate is very similar to one for symmetric stable processes Rn, where n is replaced by alpha because of a priori it could be arbitrary number, and notation beta is preserved. Right? And of course, mod x minus y is replaced by abstract distance. Right? Um, of course, this could be a straightforward generalization of the knowledge for jump processes in Rn, 
But there is one more motivation uh, why try to ask uh, this question. Uh, with Takashi Kumagai, we actually proved that if uh, the heat kernel satisfies estimate of this type with some tail function phi, this is on diagonal behavior, this is scaling between distance and t, mm -hmm. certain, and assume that there is certain function phi so that this is satisfied, tail function. Then this phi has to be exactly this one. Right? There is process. So <coughs> diffusions could be different, right? Exponential things and so on. But for jump process, there is only one possibility. So this simplest possible heat kernel estimate for jump processes in general. Therefore, it's natural to ask when this um, estimate holds, under what assumptions. That would be similar to the question that I discussed at the beginning, under what condition on Riemannian manifold Li Yao estimate holds. This is the simplest possible estimates of the heat kernel, and one can ask when this is the case. And same question is here. Um, um, okay. So it turns out, first of all, there are necessary conditions. Three is uh, this estimate, stable-like estimate. Right. First, um, oh, somehow. Ah. there are, first of all, simple necessary conditions. First of all, this estimate implies so-called alpha regularity of the metric measure speed. That is, measure of every ball of radius r has to be of the order r to alpha, which implies that alpha is Hausdorff dimension immediately, uh, and that measure mu is comparable to Hausdorff measure of uh, dimension alpha. Right? So basically, it all becomes um, Hausdorff dimension. Alpha becomes necessarily Hausdorff dimension. As we have seen, in Euclidean space, alpha was equal to n, which matches uh, this remark. And uh, also, the heat kernel bound of stable-like uh, type implies that the jump kernel must be of this order, as or the distance of x, y to the power minus alpha plus beta. Not exactly equal, but comparable. That is, ratio bounded by constant. That's big difference, turns out, uh, when exact equal or comparable. Although it doesn't look like that, but technically it's big difference. So, uh, then Chen Kumagai proved in 2003 that on abstract situation, if beta is still between 0 and 2, then these two not only necessary, <coughs> but also sufficient condition for the stable-like estimate of the heat kernel. Right? So, this completely settles this question, uh, but when beta is between 0 and 2. One can say this is quite satisfactory, because in Euclidean space, we also have seen this index has to be between 0 and 2. But turns out, with development of analysis on fractal spaces, there are quite a number of interesting situations when index of the process can be actually larger than 2. Right? This um, comes in fractal theory. Here are two popular pictures of fractals, just to make immediate uh, link to this. <laughs> Uh, Sierpinski gasket and Sierpinski carpet, although on this picture they are bounded. In fact, in our theory, we should consider them unbounded versions of them. One can extend this construction to make it unbounded. Right. So uh, it was a series of papers by Martin Barrow and others that on many families of fractals, including these two, there is diffusion process. They actually construct a diffusion process, which is non-trivial. Uh, constructing measure is simple, it's just Hausdorff measure. One needs only to detect Hausdorff dimension. But construction of diffusion process requires construction of local Dirichlet form, which is very um, uh, non-trivial problem. But then it was done, and moreover, it was shown that heat kernel exists also and satisfies the following remarkable estimate, which is called sub-Gaussian. Because scaling between distance and time here is given by not by power 2, as in Gaussian case, but by power, which I denote by beta star here, um, which is new parameter. Alpha is Hausdorff dimension, and beta is new parameter. 
Or right. alpha is the half source dimension of a yeah. fractal. Oh, yeah. yeah, of yeah. whatever is fractal, yeah. right, yeah. Um, and beta star is a new invariant, invariant of the metric space alone, mm -hmm. which is called walk dimension, right? It doesn't follow from outdoor dimension, it's new uh, parameter, right? In Euclidean space, this beta star is two. Therefore, we never see it, right? It's mm -hmm. always two, right? But if you go further away to analysis of fractals, we see new parameter appearing there apart from outdoor dimension. Uh, so it turns out that this alpha and beta star being two characterization of the space in question must satisfy always this restriction. This beta star is at least two, and but bounded by alpha plus one. Uh, and moreover, uh, uh, ah, here, just a minute. Uh, ah, and then, moreover, uh, every pair, alpha and beta star, satisfying these restrictions will give rise to certain fractal where this heat cone bounce is true. That was, again, also constructed by Martin Barlow. Uh, so it's a continuous uh, family of two parameters, right? So, yeah. and Euclidean spaces op corresponds to particular case when alpha is n and beta star is two. Euclidean space and this family is just a uh, few points, right? So typically we can see that beta star has to be larger than two. Uh, value two is kind of borderline for beta star. And on, for example, on Sierpinski gasket, beta star is log five over log two. On Sierpinski carpet, exact value is not known, but it's about 2.09 or something. <laughs> yeah. Well, larger than two. On all reasonable fractals, it's strictly larger than two. Exactly two is really like Euclidean situation. Right. So therefore, yeah, but then by using again subordination technique that I already once mentioned, one constructs on such spaces jump process where the heat kernel does satisfy stabilized estimate that I already mentioned above, uh, where beta here, alpha is the same as above, Hausdorff dimension, but beta is any value between zero and beta star. So beta star, the work dimension is just upper bound for the index of possible jump process. Exactly like in Euclidean space was number two, right? So therefore, in particular, this uh, beta index of the process here can be strictly larger than two. If beta star is larger than two, then also can be larger than two. Right. Now the question becomes more complicated. Assuming that, uh, uh, I already were far away from this, Volume condition V was the condition that measure of every ball in this metric space in question if of order R to alpha. And J condition was that <coughs> the jump kernel is of order distance between x, y to power minus alpha plus beta, right? So assuming these two conditions that were enough, oops, I think I pressed something wrong, uh, that were enough in the case bit larger than two, one still can ask what happens if uh, in gen for general beta, if beta is larger than two. Um, so turns out that these two are alone not enough yet uh, to get this heat kernel bound. Um, one needs one more condition. I don't uh, state it here because it's no, not really important for what follows, but nevertheless, one needs the third condition which was established quite recently independently in these two um, preprints um, by Chen Kumaga and Wong and uh, myself, Jashin Hu and Arian Hu. We call it condition GCAP, generalized capacity condition, and Chen Kumaga and Wong call this cut of Sobolev inequality for jump kernel. In all cases, this is condition which uh, uh, claims or uh, ensures that there exists certain test function with controlled energy. Uh, more or less, right? But how it looks technically it not, doesn't matter here. So the common result is that these three conditions together are equivalent to heat kernel bound like that. Mm -hmm. right. But now I come closer to the main subject of this talk mm -hmm. <laughs> after this long introduction. <laughs> um, we are going to consider a similar question 
uh, this was on arbitrary metric space, locally compact metric space. But we are going to consider this to specific type of metric spaces, ultra-metric spaces. Uh, and then turns out that on ultra-metric spaces, the third condition can be thrown away. That is a nice feature of those spaces. So the result will be more similar like on manifold situations when one doesn't need such complicated conditions. Um, in some sense, uh, a result of this type could be considered, uh, or, okay, I'll later I'll say, a result that one of the results that I'm going to say would, could be considered as um, a result about Liao estimate, equivalence with volume doubling and Poincaré inequality, and uh, this turns out can be done on ultrametric spaces. But then, of course, considering the, some spaces just because something is simple there is good, but not maybe not enough motivation, but then I will show there is another motivation to look at those spaces. Um, now we come to a completely new subject. One can forget everything which was before <laughs> and start a new <laughs> at, uh, notion of ultra-metric space. So this is metric space, MD, where the metric D satisfies a stronger uh, inequality than just classical triangle inequality. That is, for all x, y, and z, distance between x, z must be bounded by maximum between distance x, z, and z, y. Of course, classical triangle inequality when there is plus here, right? But if we replace plus by max, we get stronger inequality, which is called ultrametric inequality, and this metric is called ultrametric. Uh, I'll give examples of this space on next slide. But first, maybe as simple exercise, let us look at some unusual properties of ultrametric balls. But we define balls as to be close to one that's more, more convenient in this setting. Uh, these are balls with respect to ultrametric, right? Um, then the first claim, let us just look at this. Ultrametric property implies that any two metric balls of the same radius are either disjoint or identical. This is very unusual property of balls, right? Typically, we think of balls of something like that, right? Uh, two balls of the same radius can overlap, but not to be the same. But in ultrametric space, this is not possible. If they overlap, they must be the same, right? So there is no way to move a little bit away, right? The proof is very simple, but just to get used a little bit to this property, let us uh, see it, right? So let us take two balls of the same radius, but with centers x and y. Assume that they have non-empty intersections. So point z is common between these two. It's not yet this picture, but just we can imagine. Z is common point between these two, right? This is x, this is y. Um, then distance between x, z is bounded by r, and distance between z, y is bounded by r. Right. Therefore, between x and y is also bounded by r, right. by max. Right. Therefore, y has to be also inside this ball, not like on this picture. Now we come to this picture. This is x, y is inside the same ball. And now let z be arbitrary function in ball of centered at x. Then distance, again the same argument. Distance between z and x is bounded by r. Distance between x and y, as we have seen, also bounded by r. Therefore, this distance is also bounded by r between y and z. That means z is in the ball centered at y. In, that means that this ball is subset of this ball, and of course the opposite is true too, and they are the same, right? <coughs> so, um, so it's a bit unusual. There are many consequences of that. In particular, in any ball centered at point X, every other point Y is also a center. Because if you take mm -hmm. ball centered at Y of the same radius, it will be the same, of course, right? Mm -hmm. So therefore, uh, there is no distinguished center. Mm -hmm. In every ball, every point is its center with the same <laughs> radius. Right? It's very difficult <laughs> to think of this, but it's the case. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, or another thing is that 
uh, if we take all distinct balls of the same radius, they form a disjoint partition of the whole space. There's no way. Uh, it cannot be that. <laughs> or another thing uh, is that all balls are not only closed sets, but also open sets, because every point inside is the center, of course. But it's also open set. Uh, in particular, this uh, all implies that uh, such spaces must be totally disconnected. There are no connected sets, uh, no open connected sets. So these um, a bit uh, strange spaces, if you are not familiar with them, then it's, all these properties look a bit uh, weird. <laughs> but here is an example. Uh, so people in number theory are quite used to that. <laughs> These are periodic numbers, okay? right? And don't, they don't care about such weird properties of the balls. <laughs> this, this is all OK. So let us take a look at this. Um, so uh, we start with the uh, a field Q of rationals, and then introduce periodic norm as follows. If X is a rational that can be represented in the form, a P is a fixed prime number, right? If it's, uh, any rational can be represented in the form P to some integer power N, positive or negative, times A over B, where A, B are co-prime with P, uh, then uh, N is uniquely defined, and the norm of X, P norm of X, is defined as P to the power minus N. That is, high divisibility of x by p, or powers of p, leads to small norm of p. Mm -hmm. right? And in particular, in addition to that, if x is 0, the norm is defined to be 0, because x is divisible to any power of p. Mm -hmm. right? So that's um, the periodic norm. And then uh, one completes q with respect to periodic norm, and gets the field QP of periodic numbers. The same way as one gets real numbers by completing Q with respect to Euclidean distance. But this is different uh, distance. A periodic norm, of course, any norm determines distance, right? Therefore, we can speak about uh, altrometric norm if it satisfies altrometric inequality for the norm. So every periodic norm uh, uh, is, satisfies altrometric inequality. Uh, which is written in the end like this. The norm of x plus y is bounded by maximum of these two. So why is the case? Because if x has this shape and y, let us consider another rational y, which has the shape p to the power m times c over d, c over d being, being co-prime with p, and assume that m is bounded by n, right? Just one of them has smaller value of this power. Then the sum, when we take out, uh, sum up x and y, we just take out p to the power m, and um, p to the power n minus m is then integer, and, uh, and we see from this representation that the norm of that will be bounded by p to the minus m. Right. Because the denominator here is co-prime with um, p, and then this implies that. And this is exactly maximum of these two. This very natural way how altrometric inequality appears from completely different consideration, from uh, just divisibility properties. So uh, Q and QPs are then uh, altrometric spaces. Just to see a little bit more about that, um, every periodic number then allows expansion into power series in uh, P of P. Uh, which is written as real numbers, a sequence of uh, periodic digits. Periodic digits are those between 0 and p minus 1, with <coughs> dot between to separate negative powers from positive powers. But the difference uh, is that this series is infinite into positive powers, unlike real numbers, because positive powers of p have smaller norms. p to the k has a norm p to the minus k. Therefore, the uh, series of norms for this number will be convergent. So this um, periodic number is, uh, has infinite sequence of integers to the left and finite sequence to the right after dot. Right? Um, and the norm of x uh, having this shape is p to the minus m, where m is the minimal position where a k is non-zero. If we uh, 
just see some, if some numbers at the beginning are zeros, and then the first non-zero m gives us the norm of x. Uh, in particular, uh, I want to see structure of the ball here. Um, what is the ball of radius? Let us first radius as integer power of m. Let us write p to the minus m, where m is integer number. Then turns out that if x is as before, having this periodic expansion, then every y uh, arbitrary point y, of course, let it have expansion with b's as digits, and if uh, and y is uh, in this ball, if and only if it has the, its expansion has the following shape, up to position mi minus one, digits of y are the same as those of the center x, and beginning from position m and further, just arbitrarily. We fix all digits of the center up to position m minus 1, but after that, very arbitrarily. And that would well, This way, we obtain ball of radius p to the minus m centered at x. Right. Um, and one of the consequences of that, why I'm sh uh, showing that, if we fix bm here, of course, we will get uh, and very only. Uh, digits beginning from position m plus 1, will obtain a ball of radius p to the minus m plus 1. And since we can fix bm in p ways, we see that a ball of radius p splits into disjoint union, uh, sorry, not p of this radius, p to the minus m, splits into disjoint union of p balls of the next power of m, p, p to minus m plus 1. This is how the balls are constructed in this space, right? In particular, this leads to the following consequences for the measure. Uh, so QP is a group, um, uh, so there is hard measure there. We can choose it for normalization, kind of, uh, hard with respect to shift. Shift means addition there. Right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, with normalization condition, that measure of every unit ball is one. And then by using this idea that every ball splits into union, disjoint union of P disjoint ball of the next radius, one gets that measure of uh, ball of radius P to the minus M is P to the minus M. Alternatively, one can use this as just definition of this measure, and then extend this by using one of the measure extension the the theorems, like Karateadori and so on, from balls to the whole Borel sets. Right? That's alternative way of constructing uh, measure on um, periodic numbers. Right? If R is between two consecutive powers of P, then in fact this ball is the same as the smallest one, uh, uh, the, the, because distances here take only dis, uh, discrete values, right? the distances of this value. And which implies that measure of every ball is P to the power minus M of this ball, or which is of order R which gives us idea that this space is kind of one-dimensional, right? Measure of ball of radius R is of order R. Like in Rn, measure of ball of R1, measure of ball of radius R is 2R, it's linear in R anyway. So this gives us idea of one-dimensionality of this space. Um, right. So, okay. At some point I should come to a theory. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. right. Um, now let us uh, speak a little bit about coming back to general altrametric spaces. Um, let us speak about construction of jumpers. So as I said, this space is totally disconnected. So in th those spaces, there are no continuous paths. Therefore, there is no diffusion. From point of view of probability theory, it would be desirable to construct diffusion process. There is none. Therefore, one should work with jump process. Turns out, that there is one class of jump process which is easy to construct on arbitrary ultrametric space with compact balls. Uh, for that, uh, we just fix such a space uh, and fix some reference measure on this space and fix also one dimensional probability distribution function, which is uh, cumulative, that is, it starts from zero, becomes positive here, it means positive, just very close to zero. 
and then uh, increases to uh, tends to one at infinity. That's, uh, and we assume for simplicity that its derivative is everywhere strictly positive, right? So we fix such a, such a function sigma, and consider jump kernel uh, given on this space by this formula. At first, it might look a bit uh, complicated, but if you think a little bit, just integration from distance between x, y to infinity of dr divided by measure of ball of radius r. r is between these two, right? And by algebraic property, it's easy to see that this is symmetric function. And, the, and there is, of course, this additional weight here with which we integrate sigma prime over sigma, right? logarithmic derivative of sigma. Turns out that always this jump kernel determines a regular Dirichlet form, which we call isotropic Dirichlet form. And what is surprising, heat kernel admits explicit formula with exact equality here, which has similar shape, but with additional multiple inside integration, where t appears as time, positive time, of course. Right. So this was established in our paper here. It's surprisingly it's very simple. Unlike other results about heat kernel that are usually quite involved, this one is relatively simple. So um, why I'm saying this, because now we can make some computation. Um, consider now qp to the power n. That is product of n copies of a periodic space, periodic field. Distance there would be introduced as L infinity distance, which again will be ultrametric, and hard measure will be just product measure on Qn, right? So, and then one can uh, actually show that is a consequence of what we did. If R is between two consecutive powers of P, then measure of this ball will be P to the power minus Nm. This is like one does in Euclidean space, just to take power n. If one uses this explicit formula for the measure and substitutes into here, right, and then chooses sigma as it's shown here, this very uh, this is ex, um, uh, probability distribution function exponential minus p over r to power beta. In fact, on this picture shown exactly this function. It's very very close to zero near zero, but then tends to one. Right? Uh, but uh, one has to take uh, p like this, and now better new parameter which comes into play, arbitrary positive number here. So if one chooses this sigma and uses exact formula, then the computation shows that jump kernel uh, on the previous slide is exactly distance between x, y to the power minus n plus beta. Exactly like in Euclidean space that I showed at the very beginning, uh, the uh, Levy process with index beta had this uh, jump process, uh, ju uh, jump kernel, and exactly the same is here. And then again, heat kernel computation again shows it has also the same estimate as uh, symmetric stable process in Euclidean space, except for distance here is periodic distance, not Euclidean distance, right? So we see kind of full analogy with Euclidean distance and uh, uh, Euclidean theory of jump processes and periodic theory of jump processes. Right. Um, however, this, of course, can be obtained only when j is exactly up to constant distance to this power. Now the question again arises, what is j is of order distance to minus n plus beta? So uh, now I come to the main point of this talk results uh, what happens on altermetric spaces if jump kernel is of order of distance to some power, negative power, right? Uh, so, so you're just switching from equality to... So, yeah, to value. equality, right. Yeah, it's uh, very non-trivial. In Euclidean space, it was non-trivial step, and here is also, thing. yeah. Because when you have exact things, uh, look, maybe it's more um, it's better to state it in this way. If you have exact heat equation in Rn, one gets heat kernel explicitly. Mm -hmm. This is exercise, uh, first exercise in PD equals, right? Mm -hmm. One of the first exercises. But if you consider elliptic equation with variable coefficients, mm -hmm. suppose in divergence form, getting heat kernel bounds is difficult mm -hmm. questions was done by a famous theorem Aronson in 1967, after work of Moser and Nash. 
that was big theory, just varying coefficients, although staying within uh, upper and lower bounds, uh, varying coefficient gets quite complicated things, right? Same as here. Exact jump kernel or jump kernel up to constant is again uh, switching from constant coefficients in PDEs to variable coefficients. So it looks uh, innocent, but in yeah. fact it's not, right? <laughs> so, um, right, so here is, um, I can say, uh, the first result in this area that we just did recently with uh, Sasha Bendikov and Arian mm -hmm. Hu. Uh, assuming first that uh, ultrametric space is uh, alpha regular, that this measure of every ball is of order R to alpha. As we have seen on for periodic number, this is the case. Um, and uh, mm -hmm. so, statement is as follows. Assume that jump kernel on this space, which is alpha regular, is of order distance between x, y to power minus alpha plus beta. Here, alpha is the same as here, and beta is arbitrary positive number, no restriction from above. Here, right? Then the quadratic form that we already considered above with this jump kernel determines a regular Dirichlet form. It hit, its hit kernel exists as continuous function and satisfies stabilized estimate as desired. Right? That is, uh, uh, in other words, we get a full equivalent that volume condition, this one, which is built into definition, plus J condition, this one, is equivalent to this uh, uh, heat kernel upper and lower bound uh, without any restrictions on beta. That was the purpose, in fact, to remove restriction on beta to show that alt on ultrametric spaces, additional condition which required on arbitrary metric spaces is not needed. In particular, of course, all this works on uh, periodic spaces of periodic numbers. Uh, but then, moreover, there are um, more interesting results. This, is, this theorem, in fact, is consequence of more interesting results where one assumes a little less about jump kernel, not just point-wise estimate, but one can relax those conditions, leading to results like uh, equivalence of Li Yao with doubling volume and Poincaré. For that, consider, start with Poincaré inequality for jump kernel. We say that jump kernel satisfies uh, Poincaré inequality with parameter beta if for any ball and for any L2 function in this ball, the following inequality is true. On the right hand side, this energy form, <coughs> but restricted to the ball of, uh, to this ball, right? Uh, energy of this function. On the left-hand side is usual term as appears in Poincaré inequality, f minus average value of f squared integrated over the same ball. And important is scaling parameter, scaling coefficient here, r to power beta. Beta is parameter that uh, determines this inequality. In Euclidean space, as I mentioned at the very beginning, uh, also on the manifold non-negative Ricci curvature, Similar estimate holds when one replaces this discrete uh, Dirichlet form by Dirichlet integral with nabla used f squared and beta by 2. Right? That is 2 Poincare inequality, but in, um, with respect to local Dirichlet form. But here is some generalization or extension to uh, jump kernel. And we satisfy uh, another definition uh, which we need here so-called tail condition with parameter beta, if we integrate jump kernel outside ball of radius r centered at x with respect to second variable, then it should be bounded by r to power minus beta. Um, this, uh, this is called Poincaré, and they call this tail condition for jump kernel, tj. Mm. Right. So, anyone easy, easily see that if jump kernel satisfies point-wise lower bound instead of this comparison with distance to power minus alpha beta, suppose it satisfies lower bound. This implies Poincaré inequality, uh, in fact. Roughly speaking, this j is replaced by this distance to minus alpha plus beta. This beta is consumed by this one, and alpha is consumed by measure, roughly speaking. Right? And then one gets Poincaré inequality. 
and upper bound of jump kernel point-wise. Of course, if we have point-wise upper bound, we can integrate this, and one gets exactly this one, implies TJ. Therefore, Poincaré inequality can be considered as relaxed lower bound of the heat kernel, of the jump kernel, and tail condition can be regarded as relaxed upper bound of the jump kernel, where point-wise bounds are replaced by integral versions. Right. Um, are you talking about beta? Are there any conditions on it? Must be no, no, beta is arbitrary. These are axiomatic. Let us fix some positive beta, and then all these conditions are stated with respect to this fixed parameter. Okay. Alpha was said to be a volume growth exponent here. Yeah. Right? That one, yeah. yeah, alpha was fixed, but beta is alpha was fixed by the space, but beta is fixed by us arbitrarily. Mm -hmm. So then it uh, turns out that the one can say something about heat kernel bounds in the presence of these two relaxed conditions, right? Here is actually main theorem here, that um, if tail condition and Poincaré inequality are satisfied, then the heat kernel exists and continues and so on, and satisfies the following uh, bounds. These bounds are not that precise as it, they were before. The, precise, uh, the most desired Estimate of the heat kernel, let me just put this here, was this one. This on diagonal term, and then all diagonal term was to power minus alpha plus beta. But turns out, under relaxed assumptions, of course, with relaxed assumption, we expect that we cannot expect this estimate, right? Because it's equivalent to these two. Therefore, but what one can prove that similar upper bound was with power here, not alpha plus beta, but just minus beta, right? Mm -hmm. And lower bound, one can expect only on diagonal and near diagonal, when distance between x, y is substantially smaller than t, that means when this of diagonal term is constant, right? So uh, away from the diagonal, far away from the diagonal, one cannot ensure lower bound. And moreover, this what we call weak upper bound and this near diagonal lower estimate. Weak upper estimate, near diagonal lower estimate. So moreover, if we take uh, TJ uh, as standing assumption, then Poincaré inequality is actually equivalent to these two. Right? So this would be analogous of the first theorem that I stated about equivalence of Liao estimate with Poincaré inequality and volume doubling. Although here, Analogous of volume doubling is standing assumption of plus one more additional condition. So this is equivalence for Poincaré inequality. Right. Turns out it's the case. Turns out uh, what is interesting, there are examples uh, uh, that show in, in general one cannot improve this by adding additional epsilon, maybe even no, not epsilon. This power is sharp here. And so one cannot significantly improve also near diagonal low estimate. Um, there are, maybe since I'm already out of time, very quickly the idea of example is just obtained by taking product of uh, ultrametric spaces where each mi is alpha i regular and uh, considering on each of them um, a jump kernel using this alpha i and uh, fix beta, right? And then one gets a heat kernel on the product space, uh, and this, uh, on the product space, turns out one gets Poincaré inequality and Tj, but not uh, point-wise, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but not point-wise <coughs> estimate of jump kernel. And there, so on the product space, uh, one gets uh, optimal estimates Oops, oh, did I do? Ah. Uh, on the product space, one gets, this becomes kind of optimal with little epsilon here and here, right? So this uh, really, there is good example showing that um, this uh, is the case, right? Uh, maybe I'll skip all this. Um, um, yeah, and then there are a couple of consequences of, um, um, Okay, maybe I also skip them and just finish by the, uh, again by the equivalence of uh, jump kernel estimate 
with this um, heat kernel upper and lower bound that are stated here mm -hmm. as combination of upper and lower bound. This is a consequence of the result which works with weaker assumptions. Okay, let me finish here and thank you for your attention. Possible for the dimension to be exactly n, but uh, beta star is strictly greater than two. Well, what it depends on what you mean by dimension, right? Yeah. On, of course, um, in this situation, if, if it's ultramatic space, um, dimension that is how sort dimension can be anything, right? Mm -hmm. In particular, positive integer or something. Right. This question needs to be need to clarify. Uh, the same, right? In general, yes. In general, uh, house of dimension can be anything, and beta can be also arbitrary. Oh, uh, um, beta star from the beta view star, view right? Of yeah. yeah. The only restriction is, uh, as I already uh, wrote there, I just remind. So if house of dimension is alpha, then a beta star, this is walk dimension, can be anything within these boundaries, right? Anything. If you consider uh, for um, abstract metric measure situation, right? Or for fractals, for example, this is like that. Mm -hmm. So, in particular, of course, typical, as I said, that the star should be joined down to typical. Two is borderline case. And alpha can be any number, in particular integer, so no restriction. Thank you.